Yes, hi everyone, my name is Emily Myers. I am a scientist and Parkinson's disease researcher at the University of Washington here. I'm also an executive board member with my union, UAW 4121, which represents over 5,500 employees, uh, graduate students and postdocs here at the University of Washington. Um, I do have to leave immediately after this, so I am so sorry and I, I'm so glad you all are here. I do live right down by Guanacos, so if you see me walking around with my little dog, it's sometime, you know, I walk twice a day around here please stop us and say hi and please say hi to my dog panini because he is very needy um, but yeah I would love to stay and chat with you my campaign manager is gonna stick around and answer any questions that you may have for our campaign and I just want to say thank you and um, please check out my website it is emilyforseattle.com thank you thank you right on. so under time that's brilliant uh, Ms. Tuttle would you like to take a look Hi, I'm Kathy Tuttle. I'm going to be leaving a little bit early too, uh, to, but I'm here for the next half hour and uh, my uh, campaign manager will be here through the end of the meeting and please check us out. I did want to mention uh, my endorsements just in case I didn't get to do a closing statement. That's the 46th District Democrats, uh, Council Members Richard Conlon and Tom Rasmussen, Alan Durning, Heather Trim, Ed Lazowska, Jerry Large, Arvia Morris, Inga Manskoff, and a lot of other wonderful community people. That's because I've been working in community for the last three decades. I worked uh, for the Parks Department. I put in 40 parks and community centers as a planner and project manager. I've worked for the Seattle Planning Commission and I've started nonprofits. I'm a person that's really good at talking to people and building community coalitions and getting things done. And I'd like to get things done in this community and I'm the more I'm talking to you, the more I'm seeing that I'm uh, on that side of saving the app. So let's talk more about that too. Kathy Tuttle. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Heidi Stuber. I'm not leaving early, but I did come in a little bit late. Thank you all for your patience. I'm so excited to be amongst small business people here today. I'm a small business leader. I have been for many years, and I came just off a classic small business emergency and property management, which is an alarm going off and knowing, knowing, no one knowing what the security code was. So that's why I was late today. I run a small business. Um, I have about 15 employees. I'm raising a special needs child child and I'm running a campaign and I'm able to do all those things successfully because I'm somebody that gets things done. I'm very effective, I work hard, I know how to prioritize and I'm running because I want to see Seattle change for the better. I think we can do a better job addressing the big issues facing us like affordability, homelessness crisis, climate change and our schools and I want to see the next city council member create a more livable, affordable and sustainable city right now and for the next generation. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? My name is Sean Scott. Um, I'm also not leaving early. Um, it's something I don't have in common with Rob Johnson. Um, you know, it, I used to be the editor of. Uh, is that good? Used to be the editor of uh, Real Change News. So the conversations that a lot of people have um, and deep concerns that people have about what we're going to do to house the homeless um, and also build a more inclusive city that is not a city that is uh, rife with rampant displacement is one that I saw up close a lot of times um, as editor of that paper. And so for me, I'm looking forward to a very robust discussion hearing from as many community partners, uh, longtime residents of the university district as possible about what it is that we need to do to make District 4 um, as inclusive a district as it can be and make Seattle a city that goes into the future um, but doesn't leave behind a lot of the things that made us um, special getting to this point. So look forward to a great discussion. Thank you for attending, everybody. Hi everybody, my name is Alex Peterson. I will be here for the rest of my life because I live just a few blocks away. <laughs> and it's great to have a forum focused just on the University District. It's really the heart of this Seattle City Council District that we're all running for. And it's really a special place. I've knocked on the doors in every precinct in the U District. and. It's a neighborhood, as all of you know. It's a, it's a special neighborhood. City planners down at City Hall view it as an urban center or a transit hub, but those of us who live here know that it's a special neighborhood with the small businesses that we all cherish and we want to preserve. So 
I was doorbelling today. I've knocked on the doors of 12,000 voters already in the district because we've got to be that responsive district council member. And I was in View Ridge today and I met somebody named Patricia. And what she said is what I hear from residents throughout. They want somebody who's going to listen to them. They want a council member who's oh, actually going to no, listen. It's, it's, a, it's a cut you off. That's okay. No. We'll talk more. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joshua Newman. I live in the Ravenna neighborhood with my wife and our four kids. I was a lifeguard, a preschool teacher, and for the last 13 years, a union engineer at Boeing. I've coached my kids' baseball teams, I've served on the board of our synagogue, and I've been the president of my neighborhood community council up in Maple Leaf, and the president of a transit advocacy group, Seattle Subway. Uh, when I moved to Seattle 20 years ago, I lived just around the corner on 11th and 52nd, and remember um, drive, riding my bike by the University Heights Center, and right before it, it was repainted. Um, it's been 20 years, I haven't moved far. I love Seattle. I remember Seattle the way it was in 99 and 2000, and I know that our future can be just as bright, uh, even as we cope and deal with the growth and manage for climate change. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Beth Mountseer. Wanted to welcome you all to University Heights tonight. I'm the board chair and have been on the board here since 2012. Um, I may not have knocked on your door, but I've probably met a lot of you through the volunteer work that I've done in this neighborhood since I lived here starting in uh, 1994 when I moved into a condo right over there on 42nd and 11th Avenue. And this was my back backyard also in terms of walking around and meeting people and uh, but I'm running and I'll introduce myself I've worked for King County now work for city of Redmond have worked on policy issues my first love and my entree into government was working on affordable housing issues in fact I known John Fox for some 30 years and the displacement coalition because that was part of my backstory of how I made that transition from practicing architecture to working for local government. And since then, I've worked on nearly every kind of policy issue. Oops. I've worked. Excuse me, we're a bit Oh, I time. thought it still said 10 seconds. OK, talk more later. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Frank Kruger. I'm really happy to be here because it's the Ave and the U District that brought me to District 4 in the first place. I'm actually born and raised in upstate New York, but moved out here about 15 years ago and started my own business. I'm currently a small business owner still running that business. But when it came time to find an office, I had to look around the city. And what did I find but the Ave and the U District? How lucky was I? I had a whole office to rent for 500 a month. That rent went up to 1200 and then it went up to 1400 and I had to move out. My office is now over in Freelard. So displacement of small businesses is very important to me, and I can't wait to help work with all of you to make sure that we keep this place stable for small businesses and that we also grow it outside of the Ave and don't ask the Ave to take on too much of a burden. I hope to talk more about it tonight. Thank you all. Uh, Hi, my name is Ethan Hunter, and since moving to Seattle 11 years ago, I've seen so many neighborhoods in Seattle change, and not always for the better. Um, I've gone to Seattle public schools, and I've seen firsthand how differently some minorities have been treated in our public schools. I also know what it's like to go to school um, with the risk that one day maybe I could be the victim of a next school shooting. Um, I think a lot of people here, including myself, are uh, unhappy with the current council, but what I see for the future of Seattle and for the next city council is a real opportunity to lead on things like climate change, uh, affordable housing, dealing with our homelessness crisis, and uh, helping uh, those addicted to drugs get the help they need. Um, what I'm asking for you is to vote on August 6th for more compassion and a new leader in city council. Thank you. Uh, oof, actually, hold on to it, thank you. Uh, so, last but not least, I would like to introduce Laurel. She is, oh, actually, oh, uh, she is a campaign manager for Sasha Anderson, who unfortunately cannot be with us because she is working right now. Hi, 
there. I'm so honored to be here tonight representing Sasha Anderson. Um, as we said, uh, she can't be here tonight. She's working for Big Brothers Big Sisters. I wanted to start off, though, by asking a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have um, unfriended somebody? A little bit closer. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, rhetorical question. How many people here have unfriended somebody on social media because of differing politics? Or maybe, maybe, you yeah, know, I have, maybe a, a local coffee shop preference. You know, um, my grandma had a saying, if you're in polite company and you want to keep it that way, don't talk about politics. It used to be that we could avoid polarizing subjects by just not discussing them. But these days, that's just not possible with our connectivity and social media and always being with other people. Um, how many of you... Oh, it's a little early to cut you off you're out of time. Oh, sorry. one man sees that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, awesome. Thank you very much for being here. So, uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, see this little thing I have right here? This this is transparency, folks. Uh, <laughs> just like we hope City Hall will be transparent if one of these guys gets selected. So, um... Oh, my bad. Uh, so that was a spoiler alert. So this will be for the community question. So unfortunately, I cannot play the Living Tribunal right now. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to ask all of you some questions from uh, our community co-sponsors. Uh, each of you will get a minute. And if, uh, yeah, if you would like to answer, just raise your hand, and I will call on you. All right, uh, so the first question comes from U University Park Community Club. Uh, the question is, what is your opinion about public restrooms at or near major transit stations, specifically near the U District Station? Anyone would like to take that up? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. One minute. I think an important thing that we have to address with our homelessness crisis is the fact that we have a lack of restrooms throughout this city, especially 24-7 restrooms. Now the U District is very special because we have the urban rest stop here, and it's a program that has demonstrated that the community needs it. People need a place that they can get to in the morning, get cleaned up, and leave. So when it comes to the question of whether we should have restrooms at the station itself, which is also by that stop, I still agree, yes, but it doesn't need to be the full rest stop thing. We can have just our standard hygiene facilities, and I would like to make sure that they, are, that they stay open definitely during the operations of the transit, but more ideally 24-7 so that we have these facilities for everyone. I'm always worried that that urban rest stop is going to go away. We can't have just one. We need multiples of these things around town. Thank you very much. So I go to the bathroom about, I don't know, four or five times a day. I think we need bathrooms. I mean, you know, public bathrooms are something that are important, not just for people who are homeless, not just for people who, you know, have special needs. We, we all need, you know, the, the, that my kids have that book, you know, everybody goes. I mean, we have to, th this makes a much more livable city. We, we need more public benches. We need more drinking fountains. We need more bathrooms. We need to have a city that is actually accommodating all of us. And, uh, uh, you know, keeping public bathrooms out of, out of the, the public right of way is is not serving any of us so yes we do need bathrooms around stations absolutely i would agree i think that the um question of public space who owns it who is going to be able to have control over it in the future which candidate is um, most robust and vigorous in their pursuit of maintaining it and growing it and is in a lot of ways a defining question for this election and this election cycle um, 
I think that one of the things, I understand that there are a lot of uh, small business owners and representatives of small business here. One of the things that we would really need to see to help stimulate a lot of small businesses in the city and in the district in specific is a culture of people getting out and walking. A pedestrian-centric culture, a culture where people feel enabled to actually explore public space on foot as opposed to um, only on their cars. I think that we would also like to see something like a policy like uh, commercial rent control in the city so that um, a lot of small Small business owners who are at risk or fear being displaced um, maybe have some of those fears mitigated. But as far as public restrooms are concerned, I think it really does speak to a real philosophical concern about making sure that we have a city that's as accessible um, to everyday people as possible. So yes to public restrooms. So, uh, well, to me, this seems like a no-brainer. Obviously, we need public restrooms. Um, as the U new uh, U District uh, light rail station is going to be coming here, um, there's going to be uh, hundreds of thousands of more people commuting through this area each year. Um, more people will be walking along the Ave, shopping uh, in our small businesses. So it makes absolute sense uh, to have a restroom there for people to use. I also liked what uh, my previous candidates mentioned about the homeless. Uh, the homeless need a place uh, for those who are on the streets to be able to use the restroom, uh, have a hygiene facility, uh, clean themselves up. Uh, so to me, why we would even be discussing this is beyond belief, actually. Um, thank you. Joshua Newman. Uh, yes, we do need public restrooms, especially in our transit centers. Um, I've been that dad rushing his young child off to a restroom or buying a cup of coffee I hadn't planned to in order to use uh, the private restroom. Um, actually, I was that dad yesterday. Um, but the there is a challenge. It's not quite a no-brainer because public restrooms do need to be maintained and they cost money. Um, most of us probably remember the interesting but ill-advised experiment with the automated restrooms downtown. Um, they didn't quite work out, so we will need a plan to fund the operation and maintain those public restrooms. We need to figure it out. Maybe the solution is to have uh, a public-private partnership with the city maybe doing ownership and, and the local business community, just a suggestion, but uh, managing it in some way to meet the expectations of the local community. But the logistics of having a public restroom um, are not straightforward. But we can figure it out. Oh, thank you very much. Anyone else before we start? No? Okay, so moving on to the next question. Ooh, this one's actually very interesting. So this comes uh, to us from our very own Seattle Displacement Coalition. Do you, uh, do you support a measure currently under study by the State Council to require developers to pay impact fees for new infrastructure for schools, transportations, and uh, transportation parks? And also to clarify, impact fees uh, would be a fee um, that would be applied to any new development uh, in order to address any displacement uh, issues. Yep. So, um, in that case, uh, just click, quick clarification. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just want to make sure I didn't spark off a lively debate here. Anyway, um, so why don't we start from this direction since you were second last. All right, so again, the question is, do you support a measure currently under study by the council to require developers pay impact fees for new infrastructure for schools, transportation, and parks? Um, I do support the measure by the council. Um, I think it's time that we have more proper planning and uh, as developers and uh, people building the buildings who are going to be making profits, they're the ones that need to be paying these impact fees um, for these new developments that are going in. Um, and again, I'm under time, but yes, I do support the current measure by the council. Right, thank you. Yes, I like the idea of an impact fee, specifically because it addresses the issue of small businesses versus large businesses. I don't want to put an undue burden on small businesses any more than we're already suffering through already in this city. But I should say that I do have a small problem with that. It's that it's a one-time fee at the time of development. As we all know, these buildings have a recurring fee, not just a maintenance fee, but an infrastructure cost around the city and around the neighborhood that it's in. I would rather see something more like head taxes and more progressive taxes that are long running rather than this one-time thing that's not going to fix 
anything. It's a short-term solution, but it's a solution in the right direction. Thank you. Great. Well, I think this is a really good question, and it goes to the heart of who's paying to provide, whether it's amenities like parks, or I would call those necessities, um, but schools and other facilities and those sorts of things. One of the um, books I think I gave away to Bill Bradbird when he was running a number of years ago was a study about California and how they do impact fees. Let me just say, most cities do charge impact fees for schools. They don't come anywhere close to paying for the new classrooms that you need. And the same thing you should recognize about all impact fees. The one concern that I have is the burden is being put only on the new housing coming into the area. I was one who thought just segueing into mandatory housing um, affordability that really the tax that ought to be there is on new commercial development which drives the need for housing. Match matching up what you're going to tax in terms of what comes to be paid for it is very important and I think we need to get it right. Uh, Joshua Newman, we clearly need to have some kind of development, some kind of impact fee on development. Um, you can see what happens when there's not enough when you go into North Seattle or into Southeast Seattle where developers in the 1950s and beyond weren't required to build sidewalks. And as a result, we're stuck with large swaths of the city now that simply don't have sidewalks. So the expectation the new developer, the new development, uh, contributes immediately to the city and to the community is reasonable and and is kind of part and parcel of, of growing in the city. However, we also know that when you raise the costs of a project, fewer of those projects are going to happen. And it's also going to price out some of the smaller developers, like developers that, that I've worked with and that I know from personal experience, that they will be challenged to do projects on their own. So we need to strike a balance. We do need to provide funding for the long run. And we do need to expect engagement now. Awesome, thank you. Yes, we should charge developer impact fees. They're authorized by Washington state law. There are 70 other cities in Washington state that charge them. They're charged throughout the United States, but they haven't been done in Seattle. And I've got a lot of experience in the private sector as in addition to my public service working for the Department of Housing and Urban Development and working for city council here in Seattle. And the developer impact fees are needed for schools, sidewalks, fire stations too, as well as parks. And developers, I think, will pay their fair share. They just need policymakers, city council members who have the courage and financial acumen to institute them correctly. The mandatory housing affordability fees that have just been enacted have to be balanced with those. We have to recognize there's a cumulative impact, but I think, yes, we should have these. Well, I'm proud to have worked as a uh, field organizer for former city council candidate John Grant. He was somebody who supported uh, impact fees. I support them as well. Um, in particular, where impact fees do not serve as a disincentive to uh, the kind of affordable housing development that I think a lot of young people, a lot of renters uh, need in this district. I think that it's also the case that impact fees, um, as was pointed out earlier, are not necessarily a sustainable uh, revenue solution. Business cycles come and go, uh, cycles of housing production, especially with as many luxury developers as we have, come and go according to the business cycle. Um, but one thing that doesn't come and go is the need for transit, the need for schools. So one of the things that we've uh, talked about in the course of this campaign is actually having a speculative real estate tax, which disincentivizes developers from building large towers that are not affordable to actual working people in the city and letting them go vacant. Um, we've talked about having a land value tax, which I think would serve the same purpose. So I would say yes to impact fees with the caveat that it's not a disincentive to housing affordability um, and yes to more sustainable revenue. Thank you. 
I was doorbelling in East Fremont this weekend, and um, I think I heard developers come up from every single door I knocked on. And I was really surprised because density can be kind of a divisive issue in our district. But one thing we agree on is that we can ask more of developers. We want to ask them to replace trees they, they cut down. We want to ask them to include more parking on site. And I think we can absolutely ask them to pay into building the infrastructure around the areas where they're developing to benefit us all. As a mom, I know that our schools are deeply underfunded here in Washington State. Impact fees will not get us where we need to be fully, but every little bit helps to keep our schools healthy and to keep our parks kept up as well. So yes, I support these. As I'm doorbelling, I often have people tell me they have levy fatigue that uh, they don't want, you know, that, that they feel like they're good people, but they don't know that they can put out more money for the libraries, for the parks, for the schools, for all of the things that we're asking people to pay money for. I think this creates a lack of trust in government, and I think it makes people cynical about any new proposals for, for actually just taking care of basic needs. So absolutely, yes, I think we have one of the most regressive tax systems in the, in the, uh, country i don't know we, we, it's terrible but we need to actually get some money from developers and impact fees seem like a reasonable way of doing it kathy tuttle awesome thank you so um the next question we'll just go from kathy down uh so what is your oh and by the way this of course comes from the district advocates and shout out there um, what is your strategy to improve community representation on the boards of the u district bia um, and the U District Partnership to justify the renewal next year. So again, uh, going from Kathy down, uh, what is your strategy to improve community representation on the boards of the U District BIA and U District Partnership to justify the renewal, renewal next year? One of the things I intend to do as your city council representative is to have a person full-time in district uh, who is, is the representative of the district. Uh, I think that we, this is something that only one of our city council members, Deborah Juarez, is doing right now, and I think it's necessary to actually work with communities to get what's going on in the communities. And so, yes, I want that person to be, to be the liaison from my office, talking to you to figure out how that university district partnership can be working with a business uh, association because I want everybody to be fairly represented at the table. Thanks. Thank you. Heidi Stuber. Um, I actually didn't know what BIAs were before I started this campaign, and it's something I, I do know what they are now, but I've had to learn about as I go along. And I think they're, um, you know, they've, they've been a little rocky in some areas. And I think any time you have a group of people that's speaking for a greater group of people, you have to be really careful about the representation that's, re uh, that's putting forth the voice of the community. So I do, do believe on all sorts of boards that we need to have it be representative of the people in the area that it's speaking for, it needs to have open meetings, needs to make sure people can give input on what the agenda is and what they're putting forth to the city. And absolutely, any city council member has to be in close communication with the local groups and so that they're making sure we're hearing your voices and we're talking to you. Having a local office is absolutely something I'd be committed to as a local representative and being present at many of your local events and so that we know what you need from us as your next city council member. I think it's the case that uh, candidates campaign as they hope to govern, um, and certainly the fact that our campaign, or my campaign I should say, uh, we're in first place for the amount of democracy vouchers that have been received, not only in this individual race, but citywide across 56 city council candidates is a statement about the fact that we hope to be accountable to the people who are on the ground and not to um, interest from outside of the city. I think that one of the things that we see um, with small business is that I would like to bring more uh, small business owners who are at risk of displacement. Um, I know that we have a lot of um, businesses that are immigrant owned, that are POC owned, uh, 
that are owned by people of color in District 4. Um, and so I would like to start the outreach process with the people who are most vulnerable um, with the march to increase commercialization that I think we've seen in Seattle over the last decade um, and getting them on board because I think um, it's part of my core philosophy as a council candidate and hopefully as a council member that when uh, we lift up from the bottom and we talk to the people who are most vulnerable and most at risk, it actually creates a condition where everybody is better off. So business improvement areas are really important to keep a business district safe and clean and the BIA and the U district is up for renewal and I, su I support that renewal. I think that having better representation is, th is the key. The University of Washington actually has is sort of an 800 pound gorilla on you know I involved in that and so i think you know having more small business representation as was said earlier having more community groups have a greater say in what's what's going on a lot of the businesses here are vulnerable they rent their space they're not landowners so that's what's tough about how the bia is structured is you've got landowners and their proportions and formulas used but then at the end of the day there's some 800 pound gorillas that are making all the decisions so we need to have better representation but i think we need to we need to renew it so we can continue the safety and cleanups that are happening thanks to the u district partnership thank you thank you <clears throat> joshua newman um the like Alex was saying, BIAs are a local example of I mean, the most local level of government we really can have. Um, and therefore, they are critical. And the renewal of the U District BIA would be is something I absolutely will support. Um, and at, since we are all value our American values and, and ideals of democracy, we want good representation. Uh, I'm not, as an engineer, I'm a problem solver. And when I don't understand a problem or when I'm introduced to a new one, I go and I look for data and I go and I look to understand what's going on. I'll admit that I wasn't aware that there were problems on the representation with the BIA. But one of my strengths is going to get data, interviewing people, talking with those involved in those stakeholders, and developing collaborative solutions. So moving forward, we can absolutely create representation for business owners. Well, I guess it's true that all politics is local and, uh, and there's always some friction on determining what the priorities are. And in particular, in the BIA's case, what are the kind of fees that you're gonna charge and how you're gonna use those sorts of things. So I've, I've also been hearing murmurings, but I'm not directly involved in the BIA right now. <clears throat> I do think you want as wide a representation as possible. And I, I'm a supporter of renewing the BIA. I think working together as a community is better than just having individual businesses trying to take care of what are community-wide enhancements, safety, other sorts of issues like that. Um, but I do think bringing everyone to the table, and as folks mentioned, the university and their vision for how the university district functions is sometimes they are the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So I'd like to see more small businesses, more of the nonprofits that are operating here, and maybe a broadening of what the BIA is focusing their attention on. Thank you. Frank Kruger. I spent this morning reading this year's meeting minutes from the BIA because I wanted to understand better what was going on here. And if I can, allow me to read something to you. The BIA describes its work as pertaining to the economic development, neighborhood revitalization, economic vitality, and livability of this neighborhood. That means it goes beyond businesses. It goes into the residential and the people who live in this community. I'd like to actually compliment the BIA on a few things. In their charter, they're required to have a maximum of 35% representation from the school. They're currently at 25%. That's good. We have the public in charge. 80% of them uh, should come from um, the ratepayers, as they call them, but the tenants are included. We can look at small businesses and large businesses, look at the distribution of the board, look at the distribution of the neighborhood, and match them. This is easy mathematics. I'm an engineer. We can solve these kinds of problems. 
I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, so I support the BIA's uh, uh, renewal, sorry. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that uh, when democracy is working best, everyone is getting involved. So that means from people to business owners, whether it's a large business or a small business, I want to make sure that especially here along the Ave, where we have a lot of minority and immigrant owned businesses, that they have a seat at the table as well. So that means bringing them in uh, on the discussion around uh, businesses in the community. Um, what I'll be doing uh, if elected uh, is hosting uh, weekly town halls with people throughout each community, um, going to different areas of the district uh, each week to hear what their concerns are, make sure that uh, what the but my agenda in the council is being representative representative of uh, what businesses and the people are telling me. So really, getting everyone involved in the political process uh, is how democracy works best, um, and that's what I plan on doing. Thank you. So um, in that case, interesting question. So it's a two-part question. Um, courtesy of the U District Small Business, uh, ah, excuse me, uh, U District Small Businesses Organization. So, again, I want to reiterate, this is a two-part question, so listen carefully. Um, do you support signing a check for $2,000 for Cliff Caudon? Okay, no, I'm not I'm kidding, that's not yeah. enough. Okay, cool, you're listening, excellent. Uh, so, the first part, do you support removing the app from the second up zone of the U District? That's a yes or no question. And then the second part, what will you do to address commercial displacement in the U District? I repeat, do you support removing the Ave from the second up zone of the U District? Yes or no? It's just a yes or no question for first part. And then second part, uh, and then what will you do to address commercial displacement in the U District? Should we start in the middle? Yes, of course. Start over here. Um, so I do support uh, removing the AV uh, from the second uh, upzoning proposal. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons why um, I support that is because I think as we, we're going to be upzoning a lot of neighborhoods in Seattle, and we also want to maintain uh, the sense of history in Seattle. And so that means certain areas, I think, should be exempt from upzones. Uh, what I would like to see to really support small businesses in the area is us to uh, that, well, actually, the Seattle Historic Preservation Program um, has, has identified 125 of 600 uh, landmark areas uh, within the district that they feel um, should be uh, historically uh, marked. And I think going forward with that plan will really help small businesses in the area uh, so that they're not displaced, uh, especially a lot of these businesses, uh, immigrant and minority owned, uh, that have been here for so long and are so, are so much of the fabric of our community here in the U District uh, and throughout District 4 in Seattle. Well, I've already mentioned that I've been displaced out of the U District. <laughs> Frank Kruger. <laughs> uh, yes, I support removing it from the up zoning. We are already at a six story up zone. The increased up zone was seven stories. And as we all know, walking up and down the Ave, we're really at one or two stories. So we haven't seen the uh, takeover of the skyscrapers just yet. And I think that we can push that off for longer. What I am proud of as a part of the MHA is the development we've done around the avenue. We can't keep expecting one street to carry the full burden of an entire neighborhood. I want to see Brooklyn developed more. I want to see the northern sections of Brooklyn and the Ave developed more. I'd even go more extreme, and I'm a fan of the proposal to make um, the Ave walkable. We have a lot of problems to deal with how we would route buses around there. We would have to make more use of Brooklyn. But I'm thinking of the far future. Where do we want to see this city go? And we want a walkable retail Ave. And I think that we can achieve that. Thank you. So I also support not doing the up zone right on the Ave. As someone pointed out, it's a small change that's being proposed. But I do want to caution people that just not up zoning the Ave is not going to preserve the small businesses that are here. I think it's really going to take much more action in terms of the kind of supports or creative ways that both the BIA potentially works, but also your council member in terms of the kind of zoning conditions just because it doesn't get up zone doesn't mean that you aren't going to have properties redevelop along here, especially with the proximity to the transit center. 
What we're really talking about, I think, is a much better approach to the kind of design requirements that ought to be along the Ave. And if you've been out to Bothell or other cities in the suburbs who also want to have neighborhoods like the Ave, one of the tricks and the reason you have smaller business owners is having smaller commercial spaces. That doesn't mean you don't let in a Walgreens, but they don't get to have 100, 125 feet along the storefront. It's those kind of design considerations that make a big difference. Joshua Newman, yes, I support removing the AV from the second up zone. Um, as for supporting the local businesses and working to prevent commercial displacement, there's a number of tools that we need to explore, uh, certainly some, some type of community foundations. We might be able to explore the idea of mimicking what Pike Place Market has done and creating a foundation that, that manages even more closely the businesses here and enables and supports those businesses. The idea of a Seattle bank often gets discussed. I'm in full support of that. And being able to provide local uh, low price loans, both to commercial businesses and also to some residents. Um, and then finally, ensuring that the Ave stays a walkable place. Creating a pedestrian plaza throughout the Ave is a lovely idea. Certainly creating a pedestrian walkway from the future light rail station to the UW. To the UW. Thank you, Josh. Yes, I absolutely support removing the AV from the up zone. I stood with the business owners in front of city council months ago calling for them to remove it from the up zone. They keep trying to put it back in. I hope you join us all in, in lobbying the city council right now and telling them keep the AV out of the up zone. There was a vulnerability study done by Peter Steinbrook, who's endorsed me in my campaign. 65% of the businesses here are, are owned by people of color or women. We've got to preserve them. Other things we can do. There's a great program that was started recently giving legal advice on, on various issues to uh, business owners, uh, increasing the marketing to encourage people to shop here, and making it a historic district to preserve it. So I don't actually support exempting the AV from uh, up zones. I want to be very, very clear about. Hey, hey, calm down. I want to be very clear about why that might be the case. I think at the same time that we need commercial rent control, I've lived in Seattle most of the time for, um, or in District Four, um, for about 26 years. I remember when twice sold, t when when the Chase Bank on the corner of the Ave used to be a twice sold Tales. Um, I remember when uh, the Urban Outfitters used to be a Tower Records. Um, and the thing about history, as has been mentioned, is that it moves on. So the real question is whether or not we want to have the city actually be the one to control what that growth looks like. I take a lot of inspiration from um, one particular aspect of Mayor Nichols's tenureship, which is that when he built, or when he was uh, responsible for overseeing light rail expanding into South Seattle, he went to a lot of the immigrant and POC-owned businesses and said, we're going to try to find ways to keep you um, from either not being displaced or giving you certain amounts of reimbursement so you can plant roots again elsewhere in the city. So I would like to see the city move forward cautiously with the up zones, um, and that's where I stand. Thank you. <laughs> I was like pulling on it. Heidi Stuber. Um, I think small businesses are really important. As a small business leader, I know that there's a lot of small businesses that are helping build the middle class, that are taking care of a lot of employees. And I think, when I think about displacement of small businesses, I don't just think about zoning and rent, but I think about all the stresses that go into small businesses. And I know as someone who's running one, that businesses are getting stretched thinner and thinner in Seattle. There's rising rents, there's rising payroll costs, there's more policies, and even great employers, employers who want to do absolutely the right thing for their employees and pay a minimum wage, a living wage, above minimum wage at my business because minimum wage is not enough to live in Seattle, um, they're feeling really stretched thin. And so I think we need to make sure that the people at City Council are responsive to small business leaders and are thinking about how these new policies, how they can be phased in over time so that people can absorb them and raise their revenue in step with their expenses so that they can survive. Yes or no? Yes or no? Oh, sorry about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
A couple weeks ago, I was uh, knocking on doors in Maple Leaf, and I knocked on a door uh, of Doug Campbell here of Bulldog News, and I didn't know it was him. He said, uh, what do you think about upzoning the Ave? And I said, sure, we should upzone the Ave. It's, it's a transit corridor. It's going to be you know, serving a light rail station. And he pushed back pretty hard. And that was good, because I went and did some research on it, and I found out that it has a lot of historic preservation, it's supporting a lot of arts organizations, it's got a lot of nonprofits. it's got a lot of low-income office space, it has a lot of affordable, deeply affordable housing already. And I think there's a good reason that you're not wanting to upzone the Ave. I, I, what I want to say is I'm a council member who can learn. I, I think that you need to be able to listen to people and look at what's what's available and actually change your mind and I have changed my mind about upzoning the app. So um, really quick, just to clarify, um, Kathy, at the end. So uh, do you uh, support removing the uh, from the um, up, uh, second upzone? Yes or no? Just yes or no? This seems like a double negative. I don't want to upzone the app. How about that? Really? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so, so um, in this order, Joshua, Sean, um, and then Ethan, uh, do you support a historic district designation for the Ave and go? Uh, yes, um, I think that it is a, I, it might be a very good vehicle to help preserve the character of the Ave, help protect the businesses, and, and help keep the U District unique. Um, I, you know, when I moved here, I, I have very fond memories of of all the shops that that even have gone like, that that are no longer here, um, and that I that I was able to visit and and all the unique uh, local businesses, right. We can explore a historic district for the Ave, um, as I mentioned earlier, maybe a Seattle bank, maybe some kind of community trust. These are different solutions, but the goal is to keep the Ave um, similar to what it is now, right? There will obviously be some evolution, um, but I don't know, it's a long way of saying yes. Well, I was actually a student of history at the University of Washington, so I think it would be pretty hypocritical of me to sit up here and say that I don't support um, a historical district designation um, on the Ave, so I do support it. Um, I see the uh, um, some um, workers from uh, Magus Books here, um, and Magus Books was you know a bookstore that um, I think helped to actually stoke my appreciation for history. I think that um, provided that we're not you know, de using a historical district designation as a way of not having um, additional actually affordable housing, additional actual public investment in housing, um, I would definitely support it. And I think that um, one of the things that's really missing from our civic discourse, both locally and naturally, is a healthy appreciation for um, sort of our shared collective past, both the mistakes of it and some of the things that we got right and need to continue into the future. So I would support it for sure. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so I do support a historic uh, district designation for the Ave, and as I mentioned earlier, the reason why I would want to do that is to really support our small businesses along the Ave, especially uh, immigrant and minority-owned businesses who make, make up so much of our community and are really the fabric uh, of the Ave. Um, as I also mentioned, we're going to be upzoning so much of Seattle as more and more people move here, um, as it's, Seattle is such a desirable place uh, to move because of our job market. Um, so. Uh, with that being said, I do want to make sure that some areas in Seattle um, are protected. And with the history uh, along the Ave, um, I think it makes absolute sense to designate it as a historical place. Thank you. All right, brilliant. All right, who's going to be lucky enough to answer this question? What do you think the UW's responsibility should be in promoting a more pedestrian-friendly, affordable district? So, let's see. Number six. Who will that be? <coughs> Sean, uh, you are first. What do you think the UW's responsibility should be in promoting a more pedestrian-friendly for and uh, for pedestrian-friendly, affordable U districts. Right, so I would like to see the recommendations of the U District Mobility Group heated. Uh, they have called for uh, the pedestrianization of the Ave um, and 
certainly we could have in the Ave a street like we have in uh, Occidental Street in Pioneer Square. Uh, a great, you know, thoroughfare for people to go down on game day, um, grab a beer, go to a coffee shop or something like that. I think that um, those kinds of street activities and a, a culture of having people out of their cars exploring the city on foot um, is something that would really um, be you know, something very, that would be very, very good. So I would like to see um, the U-Built U District Mobility Group's uh, recommendations about pedestrianizing the AV implemented into actual policy. I would also like to see a massive investment in actually public housing, not the kind of housing that we have seen go up as a result of uh, some of the less savory aspects of the MHA program, which I think has very much been uh, a developer giveaway of a lot of public space, but I would like to see the city actually do more to build and construct actual public housing, actual social housing. All right, thank you. One last one. Two more folks. All right, number three, let's see. Ah, Beth, okay, you're up next. What do you think the U does responsibility should be in promoting our pedestrian friendly and affordable U districts? Um, yeah, I'm in favor of the university being a full participant in the way its surroundings are developing. And of course, they have their own plans in terms of making sure that they're protecting, or not protecting, but making sure that the institution functions well for students and the for the whole area. Um, but I'd like to riff off of Sean's notions also in terms of just what's the kind of community we want to have. Um, it's tricky doing urban design and where do you close down streets and where do you open them up. This gets debated down in the market as well. Small businesses probably have mixed feelings about whether or not you have a pedestrian mall or whether you green the whole thing or whether you have other ways that things are getting delivered. There are alleys around here. I think it's, a, it's an interesting challenge in terms of how considering this has been the main corridor for buses to move through in the future with link light rail, it could probably open up some other ways that we are moving buses through the area and moving pedestrians, bikes, and all uh, the rest of that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, last but not least, let's see. All right, who's going to get lucky? All right, let's see. Oh, they're not here. Okay. All righty then. You can do much of us. Let's see. Oh, they're not here again. Okay, I know, right? And whoever is able would have been able to speak. Okay. Number four. Oh, Josh, looks like you get another one. What do you think the UW's responsibility should be in promoting a more pedestrian-friendly Josh Bodeman. Uh, the UW needs to be a leader on this. Uh, they have been a leader on transportation issues in the past, especially with the U-Pass, and working to reduce the number of car trips to the UW. They can still do better. They could provide a free U-Pass to staff. Um, but they need to be a leader on making the U District and the AV more pedestrian friendly, as well as, as affordable. Um, the U District Mobility Group, their recommendations do need to be heated, and, and we do need to expand the, both as transit options expand, we need to expand the affordable housing as well as uh, the current market housing that's going up in the U District. Uh, Seattle is, the U District is coping with this. All of Seattle is struggling with this. Um, as more market rate housing is built, not everyone can cope, can, can compete in that. And the city and state are going to have hey. to. Josh, unfortunately your time is up. Joshua. Thank you. Please. Oh, Joshua. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much. So, next question. What is your plan to create a sustainable and green uh, district for? Uh, does it uh, interface with the current uh, Seattle Climate Action Plan? And the first one to go first will be... Okay, who is candidate number five? And that will be Alex. Alex, what is your plan to create a sustainable slash green district for, and how does it interface with the uh, current Seattle Climate Action Plan? 
Thank you. So I'm glad I'm getting this question. I want to go through my 14 point plan on climate change. Uh, first thing we need to do is dump oh, Donald yes. Trump. <laughs> dump Donald Trump. Trump's the worst thing we have for climate change right now. We need to implement Jenny Durkin's climate action plan. It's very detailed. We can actually implement it faster. We need to encourage more use of solar power, protect and expand our tree canopy, reduce emissions of our green, to make our fleet green faster. We need to get more people to ride light rail. We're gonna have two more stations opening up. We need to renew the supplemental bus service levy, but make the buses better so they work for everybody. Make sure density is focused around transit. Require large institutions to get more people to commute. Expand the city's commute trip reduction program, which has lots of loopholes. Phase out gas leaf blowers with a buyback program. Work more closely with the Port of Seattle to reduce emissions from planes, trains, Okay. Trucks. Thank you. We're at time. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Let's see who is next. All right. Let's see who is lucky candidate number three. Oh. Okay. Beth the guy. Uh, what is your plan to create a sustainable slash community district for as an interface of the current Seattle climate action plan? Um. Was. Well, Alex just mentioned there's a great plan, plan of action that can be um, executed in this city. Um, one of the other things I've been trying to talk to people about though also is some of it is the investment in resiliency in this city, looking to the future. We're trying to mitigate as much as possible and lower CO2 or G8, um, greenhouse gases. But the other thing is thinking about the future and the climate change that is probably coming and is already here. That means thinking about our infrastructure, the water supply in the future. One of the reasons that we're doing combined sewer overflow control projects is because we have more of these flash storms that cause flooding in the neighborhood or sewer overflows into Lake Union and to Lake Washington. So it's those kind of other things that I would also be looking at in the bottom line in terms of the kind of investments that the city ought to be making to prepare for climate change and to make the city as resilient as possible. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. So, what is your plan to create a sustainable slash green district for as it interface with the current Seattle Climate Action Plan and go? Our current action plan is to have an electric bus fleet by 2040, and we are a long way from getting to that bus plan. We need to be more aggressive, not only in purchasing new buses, but selling ours and getting new ones. We already know we have a limit on buses already. That's why we have limited routes throughout the city. This is something that we have to put our money to and to fix that problem. But you know, vehicles are only 50% of the problem. Buildings are another 50%. Right now, we have a tune-up program going around the city where the city will inspect you and give you suggestions on how to make your building more efficient. Right now, this is a voluntary program. Although the group has enforcement powers, they choose not to use them. As a council member, I would choose to have enforcement. No one is gonna fix the environment, unfortunately, out of the goodness of their hearts. We have to give them a real reason to, and that means penalties, unfortunately. Let's be aggressive about fixing not just our vehicles, but our buildings. That's, uh, ooh, ooh, okay. I'm um, looking at this question, and it is going to be an interesting one. So, what is your opinion of the corporate worker slash Amazon tax? Just to clarify, we're talking about the head tax, the employees hours tax. And uh, let's see who's going to go first. All right, candidate number seven, uh, Ms. Heidi Stewart. You're up. I like this question. Um, the head tax is one of the reasons I ran, actually. I thought as a small business leader, it was the wrong way to move forward. Um, I'm not saying that I don't think big corporations should be a part of the solution to the big problems our city faces. I think they can, but I didn't think that was the right way to go about it. I thought the head tax involved a lot of grandstanding and not a lot of planning on how the money would be used or how it would be effective for our community. And when I knock on doors, I hear from constituents 
constituents. I'm not the only one who thinks that. I hear a lot about homelessness. I actually hear a lot about the head tax. And people say, it's not that I don't think businesses should pay their fair share, but we need to have trust that city council can use the funds effectively, and we need to see the plan for the revenue so that we know where it's going. So I think in the future, if we want businesses to be a part of the solution, I think we have to bring them to the table, and we have to give the voters, more importantly than the business, the voters need to know where that money's going to go and how it's going to be effective to creating housing that is actually affordable and helping people get sheltered. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see who's up next. Oh, sorry about that. You should yeah, do it it's easier here. if we do it out here. Yeah, it's a bit awkward. Okay, that person's not here. <laughs> Bollocks. Okay, in that case. Uh, Alex, you're up next. What is your opinion of the corporate worker slash Amazon tax? So I, I oppose the head tax, but let me go into some detail. You can see why it came about because we have the states, we, we have the most regressive tax system in our state and city council has limited tools. They were trying to address an urgent crisis, homelessness, which is the number one concern that people have when I knock on doors too. And so, but you need to do it right. You need to have a plan. I'm running on accountability. You need to have a plan on exactly how you're gonna spend the money. You need to focus on using best practices proven to reduce homelessness. You need to have a system in place. I think the business community wants to get involved. You just saw uh, Amazon put up additional money today. Uh, so they wanna get involved and it's the city council's job to prove that we're working, we're using effective programs, we're working working with King County where there's mental health and drug dependency dollars. We need to have a sh show them that they can trust to put their money in city council's plans. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay, in that case, our last contributor, who will it be? Okay, let's see, five and seven are out. Ooh, Frank, Ooh. it's back to you. Wonderful. Hi everyone, Frank Krueger. I'm gonna be pro head tax. That's because we've already mentioned that we need, re we have regressive taxes and we need a progressive tax. This summer, we're all gonna vote for a library levy. And I'm saying you're all gonna vote for it because we're good people and we know that the library provides social services throughout this city. But this shouldn't be, we shouldn't be relying on levies for this. This should be a part of our general fund. We should have the money to pay for these basic social services. I am pro ahead, thank you. <laughs> I am pro ahead tax. I'm, I, I even want to push it farther. I have places where we can put that money. I have an ambitious program. Let's hire 1,000 social workers. It's a huge number, it's crazy, but let's think about how that would change things. We know that the homeless aren't helped without personal care, personal attention. We know that we are understaffed. Let's solve the problem in one big, bold move, and to do that, we need money. Thank you. Really? Thank you very much. Okay. okay, so a little disclaimer with this one. Um, in the future, please make all of your questions legible because there are two <laughs> words that I cannot read here, but um, I do, I know the gist of the question. So, you know, shouting out those two words. Uh, so, um, the community member writes, I am concerned about parking in the U District. Currently, new apartments are not required to provide parking for tenants or to offset the absence of street parking and it has eliminated um, street parking. So what would you do about uh, parking issues in the U District? And the first, let's see, okay. So Beth, you go first. I think uh, this is one of the things that I was talking about. We were all at a forum last night as well. Parking issues, I think, are, it's part of our transition period here. We're probably always still going to have some single occupancy vehicles, but those of you who've worked um, or tried to build something with each parking space costs at a minimum $60,000 to go into a building. There are places where they're probably needed, recommended. My, my stance is the market ought to determine where that is. 
places where you're building small units right next to transit, you probably don't need all the parking spaces. But I can tell you in the city of Redmond, we're right now doing an analysis of what is the parking availability in the downtown where there's going to be a new transit station. What is the demand? Not everyone can go without a car, we get that, but on the other hand, the slavishness of the only way we're going to be able to get around is by a car is not looking to the future of what we need in our communities in terms of more diverse transportation. Thanks. Okay, okay that was interesting language. Um, all right, so let's see. All right, cool. Um, Mr. Scott. All right. Oh, you're holding out on me. Um, <laughs> hey, don't worry. So this is, I think this is a really complicated question in a lot of ways um, with a lot of components to it. I think if it's the case that so many people have been displaced from the city of Seattle and have been forced to lead more car dependent lifestyles as a result of a lot of, of, a lot of the unaffordable development that we see, I think it's actually unfair for a lot of developers to then get away with not providing any additional parking. Um, I also understand the other part of it, and certainly as a candidate who's been endorsed in this race by the Sierra Club, I understand that we want to get away from a situation where we're dependent so much on cars, so that I think a, a good middle ground solution, while we're trying to build that grand uh, car-free future where people don't have to travel long distances from home to work, is to actually have some of our larger developers be on the hook uh, for providing um, um, additional parking, but to have a lot of that be underground where possible, in particular for a lot of the developers that are more resourced, so that we um, are simultaneously able to do two things. Number one, alleviate, um, provide more free space or more public space on our city streets, and B, provide the parking okay. that we need underneath those Scouts. units. All right, so I rolled a seven, and Stuart, you are up next. Uh, again, uh, the question about street parking. What would you do about parking issues in the youth districts? Well, this is an issue um, like some issues that I don't have a tremendously strong opinion about either way. But what I do bring to this race is somebody who believes in balanced solutions. I think often the right thing to do isn't one of the extremes, get rid of all parking, make sure parking exists on streets as it does now forever, but that the right answer falls somewhere in between. I agree that developers should, more should be asked of developers, as I said earlier. I think even um, in some of the big multifamily units, it's probably not needed if it's close to transit that there's a parking space for every single unit, but having some that people can pay for within the development makes sense. I also think we have to think about how we're going to phase out parking over time as public transportation use increases, and we need to have space for dedicated bus lanes particularly. So I think, what do we need right now? A lot of people are still commuting by car. In five years, it's going to be less. In 20 years, we need to have very few people commuting by car. And so we need to phase out parking over time but there's still a place for some of it okay. right now. Let's do it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Ethan, we've not heard from you for a while. So uh, this question, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to be as clear about this as possible because there are a couple of uh, side notes written on here. Uh, so um, how do you prevent the displacement of critical services due to development or the closure of, church, uh, closure of churches, uh, such as a Roots Emergency, uh, a Roots Youth Emergency Shelter, Middle Exchange Sites, uh, Child Care? Um, okay. Um, and other social service uh, organizations? Uh, so, an important question. I think it's a real responsibility of the city council to make sure that we have services uh, throughout our city uh, for everyone who needs help. Uh, so that means for uh, youth who might be homeless or displaced, getting them the help that they need, uh, working with uh, churches, uh, local small businesses, uh, to really make sure that they're doing their part um, in helping the community. Uh, for those that have uh, mental health issues, uh, I think statewide we really need to look into reopening mental health uh, institutions which were closed uh, quite a while ago and it's caused a real problem especially with a lot of homelessness in seattle uh, so i think real responsibility that the city has if we're serious about being compassionate uh, towards a lot of our citizens and doing everything that we can to make sure that a lot of these services uh, are retained in future budgets and then expanding on them going forward cool awesome thank you very much 
Uh, so, let's see who gets next. Oh, yeah. A team that works together wins together. All right. Number one. You get to go oh, again. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is fun. Okay. Otherwise, you would have gotten a sec uh, second shot at that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Miss, oops, sorry, Mr. Scott, the question for you: um, How would you prevent? How will you prevent the displacement of critical services due to development slash closure of churches, uh, services such as the Roots Youth Emergency Shelter, needle exchange uh, sites, child care, and other social service organizations? Right, so one of the things I think we have to realize is that the reason why the not-for-profit sector, the reason why uh, many members of our faith community, the reason why so much of the private sector has had to assume as much of a responsibility as it has in recent years and in recent decades um, for providing these social services is because there's been a real um, recession or an abdication of the responsibility that government has towards providing those services. And so at the same time that many of our community members are big-hearted enough to pick up a lot of that slack, I also think Think that we should not have to be uh, working so hard as a community um, as far as filling the void that government formerly used to. Um, so that I would like to see a safe consumption site open somewhere north of the Ship Canal Bill uh, Bridge. I would like to see the expansion of the city's community service officer program, which was recently instated. That's 400 unarmed officers that are on the streets directing houseless and homeless folks to services and to housing. And I would also see, like to see progressive revenue solutions to pay for it so that it doesn't necessarily have to come out of um, our property taxes, so that it doesn't have to come out of regressive sales taxes, so that... Um, okay. Development slash closure of churches and services such as the Roots Emergency Shelter, veto changes, child care, and other social service organizations. I also want to tie it to the national and state level inequality that we've been experiencing. We know that because of our regressive tax structure, both at the federal and state level, corporations and the wealthy have not been paying their fair share for the last 40 years. And that is why mental health facilities have closed. That's why we're looking to the, our police department and our fire department to address people who are in a mental health crisis on the street. It is an abdication of the overall community from providing to the needs of those who are less fortunate and are struggling. When we look at uh, the services that are being offered by our faith-based communities, we need to be able to fill some of those roles by the city, especially regarding housing, especially regarding uh, shelters and transition housing and emergency housing, uh, as well as housing support. Uh, as for a lot of many of the other services, we can continue to support and fund them uh, as we have done now and we can expand it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this one's interesting. Let's see. The question is, how would you compensate or mitigate for the loss of backyard habitat for birds, including shrub layer and other plants due to denser zoning? Okay, flora and fauna. Okay, let's do this. Okay, so, Frank. Flora and fauna? Yeah. All right. Birds and other plants. Oh. Probably the most interesting thing that I learned on this campaign was just how passionate people were about the trees in Seattle. It was pretty uplifting, to be honest. I thought I was the only tree hugger out there. So let's start with a tree offset fund. Any time that we're going to cut down a big tree, we're going to have to pay into a fund. We're either going to have to replant that tree, or we're going to have to make sure that tree gets planted somewhere else in the city. That second option may sound a little weak to you, but I'm very excited about it because Seattle does not have good coverage throughout the city. We are very lucky here in District 4 to be in a very beautiful neighborhood, but not everyone else is so lucky due to past mistakes on zoning and just sheer incompetence. So let's fix the past. <laughs> let's have a tree offset fund and let's consider um, other opportunities for the trees as in um, uh, purchasing trees for families who can't afford them. Large trees are often very expensive. Let's help out. Right. Thank you very much. 
so I'll say no offense to everyone here, but just so you know, District 2, we have Dakota Gardens. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Southside? All right, uh, let's see. Who was next? All right, Beth. Oh, you could do so. Uh, here. So, how would you compensate or mitigate for a loss of backyard habitat for birds, shrub layer, and other plants included right. due to denser zoning? Yeah. So, I, I think Frank gave a great answer. I mean, the usual strategy is to do two for one replacement in areas and so on. And I think you capitalize on the areas that you do have and be adding more in the way of shrubbery. I learned a new thing the other day. Did you know? In most places where you have street trees and those sorts of things, they really only last like seven to 10 years. And so you're constantly, or sometimes longer than that, replacing those. But I realized this question was really about the greenery that you find in you know, probably more single family neighborhoods. I think there are ways that you can do good design, good landscape design, and maintain that kind of greenness on projects. That's part of the idea of clustering housing and leaving open space or places where you can have that kind of amenity, or in this case, you know, areas that really make it more quality of life. It again comes back to sort of the design, the finer points of what needs to go into both zoning and the design requirements so that we maintain a quality of life. Thank you. Thanks. Very much. All right, all right. That's the person to answer this. Is it gonna be, is it gonna be? Oh, oh, okay, they're not here. Okay. Okay, they're not here again. See, this is what happens when people leave early, like Rob Johnson. <laughs> Call back. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. Alex, it's down to you. So, how would you compensate or mitigate for the loss of back, uh, backyard habitat for birds, including the uh, flora, or shrub, layer, and other plants, due to denser zoning? <laughs> Well, I think we need to prevent the removal of trees. We need to start with preventing the removal because they, the bigger trees are much more valuable for reducing climate change and these little sticks that developers put in after they build something new. And so w there is a tree ordinance that's being considered now. And we need to make sure that it's tough, that it has teeth and protects the big trees. I want to use my time to actually correct something I said earlier. I referred to the University of Washington as an 800-pound gorilla earlier. I just want you to know I didn't mean that in a negative way. I just meant that they are, have big influence. It's more like an 800-pound teddy bear. Um, but, but we do need to preserve the trees and I, I hope that the City Council, if they don't complete the tree ordinance, I would like to take a major part in making sure it's very strong and protects the beautiful, exceptional trees that we have in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this question is interesting because I don't actually have a roll of die for this one. Um, <laughs> this is fun. Love it. So, um, please raise your hand if you're in support of some form of socialism. <laughs> yeah, it's all socialism. Oh, Public yeah, schools. Lying, that's right. Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, cool. So, uh, just keep your hands high. I'll say this again. Um, just raise your hand if you're in some support, uh, support in some form of socialism. Okay. Support some socialist policies. Yeah. 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 So, well, we basically uh, live in a. Oh, well, well, in that case, <laughs> uh, you can who, wait, hold on. Wait. Uh, whoever um, wrote that question, you can ask them about what form of socialism uh, they support, because some of you are identified socialists, and some of you support some socialist policies. So, again, our candidates will be around at the end of the forum, just so you know. <laughs> so, anyway, next question. Who asked the question? So, we can go talk to them. You know what? I, like I would like to know Sam so I could go talk to him. <laughs> we can organize together, you know? Like, get some real people to move in here, going here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, next question. Would you encourage enforcement of... Oh, wow, this this is going from the far left to the far right. Okay. Um, so, will you encourage enforcement of current park laws, such as no encampment, no drugs, no graffiti, etc.? Or would you rather change laws and allow current the current activity? Interesting. So, uh, let me just roll the dial down. Oh, it's not so much far right as center right. It's like um, CNN's Fox News, I guess. <laughs> okay. Let's see. That person's not here. Uh, 
Okay. So, Joshua, it's down to you. So, will you encourage the enforcement of current park laws, such as no encampment, no no camping, no drugs, no graffiti, etc., or would you rather change the laws and allow the current activity? Um, Joshua Newman, I. I I don't think the situation is, is quite as black and white as the question produces it. Um, first off, it is the prior, it is must be the priority of local government to provide public safety. That's that has to be its first priority. But that is public safety for homeowners visiting the park, and it is public safety for individuals who are experiencing homelessness or are coping with a mental illness or struggling with drug abuse. They deserve safety as well. There are fellow neighbors in the city. So when we're talking about uh, enforcing the rules in the park, yes, I, I don't believe that people should be allowed to camp in the park. But they're in the park because they have nowhere else to go. Our society has failed them. We haven't built enough homes in King County. We haven't provided the services that they need. So first, we need to provide them somewhere to go, a safe, secure, sanitary location, and then we can enforce the rules. Brilliant, thank you. All right, let's see the One more. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I crowd you, my friend. Okay. Uh, Josh, Josh, you already spoke. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, no double dipping, folks. Okay, you're not here. Oh. Quick, someone raid a Dungeons and Dragons game. <laughs> I think we might have an emergency with these die. Okay, nope. You know, we even a Magic the Gathering game will do. We should have done <laughs> all okay. of Ooh. Three. Okay, that will be Miss Lancier. Uh, yes, how will you encourage enforcement of current park laws, including no camping, no drugs, no graffiti, etc.? Or would you rather change the laws and allow current activity? Um, I think my answer is similar to Frank's, but maybe slightly different. I mean, there, there are not enough places for people to go. We have failed people in terms of the homeless situation that we have in the city. And I think until we have enough housing that we can house everyone, we're going to be um, finding as many alternatives, and that probably includes um, tent encampments, but not necessarily in the parks. Um, I have a real concern. I hear from my neighbors and talk to people around the city also about the concerns of encampments, especially where people are using drugs and it's right next to our playgrounds and areas where there are children and so on. I do think though that we ought to be taking some of the encampments that are working and making those into sanctioned encampments. They ought to be supported with hygiene services, garbage pickup and all those other sorts of things. There aren't enough places. But I think we also need to be focused on how are we going to get people off the streets. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, last person to answer this. Who will it be? The road. Okay, and oh, Frank, it's your lucky die. Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone, Frank Kruger. This is a tricky one. I live by Guessworks Park. And let me start by saying we do have to have rules and we have to have an acceptable, acceptable line of behavior and what's not acceptable. We have to draw that line. When it comes to encampments, we've decided that we won't allow them and I actually support that. Gasworks Park used to be full of tents and it's no longer that way. We have to say no to needles on the ground. Basic safety like that for our children needs to be enforced. But with all that said, I worry about two draconian laws in our parks. In 2017, a gentleman was heating himself by a fire. The police were called. Uh, uh, an, argument got, uh, an argument happened, a knife was drawn, and that gentleman end up, ended up dying that night. It was a tragic case where our overzealous ambition to have perfectly clean parks cost a person their life. This treads on police de-escalation, but it also means that we ourselves have to be a little bit more tolerant as neighbors. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, so in the name of transparency, we're running a bit out of time, so I picked three hot button questions from the community. And uh, speaking of police, this next question focuses specifically on the SPD. So recently the SPD were found not to be in compliance with the consent decree. Uh, knowing, uh, knowing that, today, if you were on city council today, would you vote for the SPD contract? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it just got real, didn't it? Yeah, okay. Oh, Mr. Scott. So, so up to this uh, point, I have actually been the only candidate in this race to forthrightly say that I would not have so supported uh, the SPOG contract. Uh, the SPOG contract, the Seattle Police Officers Guild contract, was um, deemed a disaster for police accountability by no less than two dozen community groups, including uh, the Seattle Police Commission um, and the ACLU, an organization that's not exactly known for their radical stances on many matters. And so I would side with those two dozen community groups in saying that we needed to have uh, much deeper accountability measures um, with respect to the Police Officers Guild contract. I also think it's the case that we are asking our police officers to do too much. I actually agree with our police chief in saying when she said that we're not going to be going to be able to arrest our way out of the homelessness issue. So that I would like to see the expansion of a community service officer program um, so that we have uh, police officers that are able to go to the homes of people like Charlena Lyles who was killed in our district. Um, and hopefully a program such as that would have saved a life. So I would not have supported the contract. Thank you very much. Who's next on this question? Oh, okay. That was eight. Okay, come on, one through seven. Oh, no. Sean already went. I can keep going. <laughs> That's an option. Yeah. I was about to say, I might want to throw some words Just too. Okay. You was me? Oh. <laughs> oh, this sounds here. Okay, hey, you want to roll? Let's roll. Okay. Yes, I did. I did say just roll. Yeah, yeah, right? um, you know, I have to say I'm not an expert at all on the contract. Hadn't read it. I've learned something from Sean as we've been doing these forms of how many people opposed it. It wasn't an issue that I was tracking. That being said, I just want to change the focus slightly of we have a current problem right now of just even hiring police officers. We have a shortage across the city. It's affecting their ability to actually deliver services that we need, the sort of calls and so on. There's been some discussion at these forums about whether or not we need a smaller coverage area. Right now it's a large area that the police are covering within the North District. Um, I don't think the police are our enemy. I think that consent decree went a long ways and we already knew it about the inequality and some of the abusive behavior by probably a small number of the police officers, but basically giving them all a black eye. I know we can do better. I don't know the specifics of the contract, but I um, think we need to continue to put the resources there for community services. Okay, thank you. Joshua Newman. Um, no, I would not have voted for the contract, and I've said that previously, so have some of the other candidates, especially Emily Myers. Um, the, the contract was a missed opportunity to enforce the compliance decree and, and negotiate with the, the Police Officers Guild on how they should move forward with with changing their practices and behaviors, not simply looking at their training, but looking at the economic incentives of their contract that encourage police officers to protect each other when they are violating their oath. The police department is, a rep is the most direct representative of the government that we interface with. And when they use force, an excessive use of force. It is an infringement upon those individuals, but also on all of our American rights. So the police officers must 
comply with American tradition and the FBI. Okay, Joshua, thank you. Thank you. To quote Monty Python, I didn't vote for him. <laughs> anyway, well, not you, being the police. Anyway, um, yes. Uh, Joshua, so, last joke aside, so we're going to change this up a little bit. Um, the question, so, for this next question, we basically run out of time, but for this next question, for this final question, um, each of you will get 30 seconds. So 30 seconds each, so please be quick. And we're just going to go down the line. Are you ready? Ready for this? Which What's right? your oldest memory of the U District? Yeah. So dig deep, oh, wow. folks. I'll tell you what. I'll give you 10 seconds just to think. To, you know, get all warm and mushy and think of your best friends. Or uh, if you are blessed to have a beautiful fiance like myself, to think of think of your significant other. So, yeah, no, she's much cooler than I am. She saves people from deportation every single day. Give a round of applause for our paralegals. Yes. Yes, much cooler. Although I do enjoy being with you. All right, you ready? What's my earliest? So, so, 30 seconds. What is your oldest memory of the U District? Uh, well, probably when I moved here uh, to Seattle um, from Palo Alto, California, uh, 11 years ago, uh, we went uh, to tour the University of Washington with my sister, and I remember walking along the Ave. Um, so that's the oldest memory I have of the U District. Um, and now, having gotten to live here for the past few years, um, have gotten to make a lot of more memories uh, here in the U District. Um, so that I guess the, my oldest one would though would be 11 years ago. Brilliant. Thank you. When I first moved out here, I was an intern at Microsoft, spending all my time in Redmond. I spent three months of the summer in Redmond. Fortunately, I had some roommates who had a better nightlife than I did, and they made me go out, and we drove across this giant bridge called 520, and it was just as the sun was setting, so you had this beautiful sunset over the, gosh, what, the buildings, the UW Tower, the, uh, the fields, and it was just the most perfect entry into UW and the whole neighborhood, and that's why I put my office here and that's why I'm staying here in District 4. I fell in love with it that day. Really? Thank you. Oops. Well, as I said, I got here in 1983 to go to grad school at UW, so this was my second home here and then I actually moved to the district, lived downtown for a while and then chose to move back to the U District. To me, I have these great memories of just what a microcosm and what diversity there is in this neighborhood. I used to stop at Bulldog News every morning while I was carrying my daughter around in a backpack. She learned to walk on the UW campus. I love that you can walk out your door and there were theaters, there was ethnic food, there was the UW bookstore, other small bookstores, all great memories. Thank you very much. Joshua Newman. Uh, I came here on a college recruiting trip and we walked down from campus and had dinner at the old Tokyo Gardens uh, just south of 45th and then we walked up to an amazing ice cream place called Marble Top that then got renamed as The Mix and is now gone. Um, it was an amazing experience coming from the far-flung suburbs of Southern California and Northern Nevada and seeing somewhere so rich and vibrant. Thank you, Joshua. For me, it was... I got you. Go ahead. For me, it was back in 2008. Uh, my wife and I brought our son here. He was two years old, and we walked from our home through beautiful University of Washington campus to come to this building, actually, where there was a raging debate about Obama versus Hillary Clinton and it was the 43rd legislative district Democrats who were meeting in the basement here. We walked in and everybody was yelling at each other and they were so passionate about it and um, then going out to eat afterwards and I think it was Chaco Canyon restaurant and going to the library and there's just so much to do here to walk that's walkable. Thank you. So I actually go back to the fall of 1994 uh, when I was about nine or ten years old. Um, we had, my dad and I had season tickets to actually watch the Huskies play on Saturday. This was the point in time where the Kingdom, where the roof was actually falling at the Kingdom, so the Hawks were playing at Husky Stadium as well, so that for a good part of the fall of 1994, we were basically down here every weekend. Um, and you know, the Huskies were a competitive football team back then, and that's how you know that uh, you know, 1994 was quite a while, quite a while away. Thank you. 
I think my earliest memory of the U District is I was actually part of a new moms group here hosted by um, University Presbyterian Church 14 years ago and I'm still friends with all the moms in that group and I have so many memories of uh, living around here and bringing my son into the U District. We used to meet our moms group at Cedars. We continue to eat here. We go, my son loves Arayas and Korean Tofu House. We've played on UW campus. We've played at the fountains down in U Village. I don't know if that quite counts. But but there's so many places, you, as an urban family, there's really so many places you can go here, and we still come all the time. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so unfortunately, um, we are five minutes over time. Sorry, folks, I know you want to enjoy a beautiful sunset, just look at that, that's beautiful. Anyway, uh, please don't get up and go look at that. Um, so, we're going to uh, limit the closing remarks to 30 seconds. My apologies, but 30 seconds each, and also don't worry, the roll is you. So, um, yeah, we'll just uh, start from um, this Tuttle, down, oh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Schubert down there, my apologies. And uh, we'll just go down this way. So, closing remarks, 30 seconds each, and... All right, my name is Heidi Stuber. I'm a former environmental science teacher, a small business leader, a single mom, and an autism advocate. I'm running because I think all those different experiences help me take a big picture, common sense strategy to government, and I think the best solution often is in the middle. And I do believe that we, and I mean the middle of Seattle middle is very left and middle of the all middle. So the. <laughs> the democratic liberal middle, let me be clear. But I think this city can change for the better, and I believe we need a new voice to do that. All right, thank you. So I think um, one of the really big considerations that's before us, not only in the District 4 race, but also in all the city council races that are happening across the city is whether or not we want to move in the direction of being a city that has very cool policies or one that is a very caring or compassionate city. Um, for me, I would like to see policies go through that make us a more compassionate city that's alleviating the tax burden um, on renters, on students, on homeowners, um, looking for progressive revenue so that we actually have the resources we need to meet the problems that we have at the scale um, at which they currently are. So thank you so much for a great discussion. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Alex Peterson, I believe I've got the experience that we need to solve the key issues facing us like homelessness. I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the Clinton administration on homelessness. I worked for the Seattle City Council for Tim Burgess as a legislative aide on affordable housing issues. I've been supporting the U District for over a decade. I'm endorsed by Peter Steinbrook, Nick Licata, Jerry Paulette, Ron Sims, and many other, and many businesses here in the U District. So I hope I can count on your support. As an engineer, I am focused on solving specific problems. And as I've talked about, digging into the details and understanding all the sides of, of the problems. We need to invest in our city yep, that's and good. make sure that we plan for the future, a future that includes more people, a future that addresses climate change, and a future that, that where we can move around the city without cars. We need to plan for this future and implement these changes with bold leadership and bold vision. Joshua Newman. Thank you. Beth Mountsier. Um, I, I mentioned this the other day. I think we're all up and down the West Coast, all metropolitan areas. We're almost victims of our success in terms of the housing affordability, the homelessness issues, and all those sorts of things. But I think we can solve those issues. I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but I think we can get smarter, and I think we can innovate. Seattle has been one of the leaders on that kind of innovation, and I believe we could do it again. I'm one of the people who've been out testing those sorts of things and doing the kind of policy work and programs that can make a difference, and I'd like to do more. Thanks. Thank you. Frank Kruger. I hope you've heard from me tonight that I'm an optimist, but I'm also an upstart. I've always believed in working for what you want. When I was given an opportunity to start a company in India, I packed my bags and said goodbye Seattle. If I have an opportunity to take advantage of something, I will. 
When I saw my friends were being taken advantage of and being exploited, I started another business to help them uh, get jobs, get their green cards, come into America and become new citizens. As an engineer, I also want to solve problems, but as a business person, I know how to make compromises and get things done. Thank you, Frank. Um, in 2020 and beyond, I see a real opportunity for City Council and Seattle as a whole to really be a leader on issues like combating climate change, dealing with affordable housing, helping our homeless and most vulnerable citizens. I think it's incumbent upon us in the future to really tackle these issues head on and be leaders for other cities around the country as what is the best way forward in dealing with some of these crises. Um, so I hope for your vote on August 6th and thank you for having me. five votes to move a measure forward on City Council. To get the vision that we want for Seattle actually achieved, we need somebody who will work to bring people together. And Sasha Anderson is that person. Sasha's been building bridges in communities her entire career. Um, from the South Sudan where she built a mentorship program to right here in Seattle. In fact, that's where she is tonight. She is working with her mentorship program. Um, under serving underserved children. We need Sasha on City Council, and that's why I hope we can count on your vote this August. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's uh, all, folks. Thank you for coming out tonight. Give our candidates a round of applause. Talk to them. Learn more. Engage in civic affairs. Be informed. And put a golf ball in one of those tubes, please.